Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Hump Day. Uh, Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Thanks for joining us today for day two of a three-part online briefing mini-series about coastal resilience and natural disaster recovery in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you missed yesterday's installment titled Federal Support and Local Action, which featured Margarita Varela Rosa of the U.S. House Committee on Natural Resources and Ernesto Diaz with the Puerto Rico Department of Natural Resources, you can visit www.esi.org, click on briefings, and watch an archived webcast. Since yesterday, when I started my introduction with some remarks about the ongoing protests across the country against racism, violence, inequality, and injustice, I posted a new web article with some additional thoughts about how those issues are in fact quite linked, quite closely linked to climate change. Some of the same topics could come up today as our panelists discuss how community-based groups have tried to recover, become more resilient, and meet the social, economic, and environmental challenges of a changing climate. Yesterday, our second panelist, Ernesto, shared some of his experience of the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, which included losing power to his home for only, his words, 34 days. For most of us, certainly for myself, a power outage of 34 hours is something to test in our endurance. And for thousands and thousands of his neighbors, days without electricity became weeks and weeks became months. In the wake of the storm, which by the way was not the only Category 5 hurricane to hit the islands in 2017, and by the way was certainly not the last major storm since then, people across Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands have forged ahead to make their homes and communities more resilient by installing solar energy systems and other distributed generation, and repair and build their homes, public facilities, and critical infrastructure to better withstand severe weather and continue to provide benefits even when the power goes out. There is still work to be done, but the progress to date is pretty great. And that's the story of our online briefing today. If you're joining us today for the first time, this week's online briefing mini-series is the conclusion of an extensive year-long effort to tell the stories of regional approaches to coastal resilience. So far, we've convened panels of experts, practitioners, and community leaders from the Gulf Coast, the Northeast of New England, Louisiana, the West Coast, around the Great Lakes, in the Southeast, Hawaii, and Alaska, as well as the need for better climate adaptation data. That is a lot. But then again, we have a very big country, miles and miles of coastline, and lots of community-based success stories to share. Like I said, today's online briefing is part two of the mini-series this week. Yesterday, federal support uh, and local action. And tomorrow, we will learn about sustainable democratic energy and public health. If you'd like to catch up on coastal resilience, you can access briefing summaries and video recordings of all of our briefings at www.esi.org. And when you visit us online, please take a moment to sign up for Climate Change Solutions, our newsletter, to learn about our other resilience initiatives, clean energy legislation, and how to stay informed about all manner of ESI goings on, including, of course, our briefing schedule. One last thing before we turn to our panelists. Because we're online today, I cannot call on you if you have a question. So if you have a question, the best way to get it to me is to follow EESI on Twitter at EESI online or to send me an email. And you can use the email address EESI at EESI.org. When we get to the Q&A, we will draw from your question submissions after we hear from the panelists. And now, on to the panelists. Our first panelist is Lori Schumann. Lori is the National Director for Resilience and Disaster Recovery for Enterprise Community Partners. There, she oversees enterprises' efforts to preserve and protect affordable housing across the nation from the risks and impacts of natural hazards and a changing climate. Her team assists CDCs, cities, states, and the federal government in a wide range of communities across the country to develop housing that can sustain impacts of natural hazards and incorporate innovative resilience ideas, technical assistance, and advocacy support into post-event reconstruction of communities. She leads the development of guidance and tools such as the Keep Safe Guide to Resilient Housing and Design in Island Communities. Lori, welcome to our panel today, and I really look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you so much, Dan, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Ellen, for inviting us, inviting me today to be with you. Um, Arturo, it's a, one, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to participate with you on this. Uh, so I'm going to just switch over to my screen and please let me know if you can, uh, how's that coming through everyone? Looking Excellent. Good. 
So I'm here today. I wanted to, um, I'm, I'm extremely excited to be with you today. We're three days into the start of the Atlantic hurricane season. And there are so many um, events happening around the United States and in Puerto Rico and the VI uh, and in so many island communities around the world. Uh, and so this is a most um, important, critical time for us to think about strengthening our homes and our communities uh, in advance of a very active hurricane season. Um, her, um, Enterprise Community Partners is a national affordable housing organization. Um, we've been working for 40 years to promote opportunity for low and, low and moderate income uh, communities throughout the United States. We've been deeply working in Puerto Rico for about 10 years, and we have been working to solve some of the most critical issues of our day facing low and moderate income communities. I lead our, in, our efforts to preserve and protect communities facing uh, uncertain and certain uh, climate uh, challenges and, and natural hazards that threaten to undermine our communities and the livelihood of so many households and millions of households around the nation. Uh, we have been working in the space of disaster recovery and resiliency since Hurricane Katrina, uh, which was over 15 years ago. Uh, we see that every event since Katrina has, is very much about housing as anything else. Um, housing is the first thing to go in a lot of these events, considering a lot of the communities we serve uh, have very few resources to invest in the maintenance operations and fortification of their homes. Um, homes are often the first line of uh, failure when a storm event hits, and we've seen how much impact these storms have had over the last 15 years. And as you can see, uh, we've lost a lot of homes throughout the last two decades, starting with Hurricane Katrina, where almost 800,000 homes, most, many of those were affordable, were lost. And then through Storm Sandy, through Harvey, to Maria, where almost 370,000 homes were substantially impacted. Uh, and bringing us to today, uh, we know that we have an affordable housing crisis in the United States and in Puerto Rico. Uh, the majority of our states face a critical housing insecurity issue. Uh, this means that a household is paying more than 30% of their income for housing. Uh, many of our households are paying in, in uh, excess of 50 or 60% of their income for housing. And much of this housing is still unsafe and not able to withstand an event. And we know that with the additional threat that many of our communities are facing as a result of climate change, uh, that more households face housing insecurity, uh, particularly in our island communities and island nations. And so what we wanna make sure we do is to preserve and protect the existing affordable housing because we know how difficult it is to build affordable housing, how hard it is to incorporate that into our communities due to excessive nimbyism and other policies that prevent affordable housing from getting constructed. So for us, this is about preserving our communities, preserving affordable housing. Mitigating climate risk is about preserving our communities and keeping them whole. And here we are at a most auspicious time where we're coming out of an incredible, still in, an incredible uh, season where so many households are sheltering in place if they have the advantage of having a shelter to shelter in place. And uh, I want to respect many of the communities that are still homeless and displaced from previous events. And so many of us are looking at COVID and a summer of quarantining in place, while at the same time we're, we're dealing with a very active storm season. So our homes have to be healthy. We have to make sure we preserve and protect our homes because if our roofs are blown away or our walls falter, we will have a very significant challenge in front of us. There are just not enough shelters that are able to quarantine folks and deal with the ongoing impacts of COVID plus the events that are yet to come. And I wanna remark on something that a dear friend and mentor of mine, Lucila Marvel, has conveyed when we think about housing, we must consider the context in which housing is built and operated and maintained that planning for housing must account for more than the physical and spatial requirements, it should always consider the social and economic needs and psychological needs of our communities. 
we must consider that housing for one family today may also mean housing for multiple generations going forward. So when we think about climate risk and mitigating risk, we must consider our current generations and future generations we're building to, as well as the needs of our households. And this season of, is, is confronting us with some significant risk. We've already had three named storms to date, and we're only on day three of Atlantic hurricane season. We're looking at incredible volatility this year, uh, and predictions say uh, hurricanes in excess of Cat 3 uh, that there will be more than eight this season alone. And we know due to warming around the states and around the world, hurricanes are stronger and they are becoming more frequent as, as well as precipitation that lingers over our communities, uh, much like Harvey did in Houston. And we know that these storm events spread disease and create conditions for vectors, which aggravate the health problems of many of our communities, communities that have already been facing extreme risk from COVID and a vulnerability that has yet to be uh, treated because we don't have a vaccine yet and we do not have a way to treat COVID. So the issues around uh, health and vulnerability need to be addressed and we need to mitigate risk because these could create conditions for more disease. And many of the communities we serve are, at, are in harm's way from the very beginning. They are designed uh, to be located in areas that are more uh, that are cheaper to build on and often are in floodplains, are in areas that are at risk from the very beginning. So when we consider mitigation, we must consider how we site buildings and housing and communities to make sure that they're safe. We know that federal agencies are often not the first to show up when there's an event, that it is our community members and our neighbors um, and leaders like Orturo that are there when there's a storm, particularly for island communities where getting supplies to our island communities is very difficult at times. And this year will be even more difficult considering the uh, issues and impacts from COVID. So we cannot wait for our good friends at FEMA to show up. We need to figure out how to deal with these events today. And so today is very much a call to action. I call upon all of you to consider when designing mitigation programs, the diversity of community members that need to be informing and defining what resiliency and mitigation is. And we need to build prototypes so that peers can learn from one another and share among each other what is critical for the communities. Secondly, we need to consider regional planning, not just localities. We need to consider regional planning when considering floodplain management and resource development. And so in Puerto Rico, we need to consider the, entire, the entirety of Puerto Rico, not just Guanica or Ponce or Mayoes or Umacao, that it's a, it's a community-wide and an island-wide mitigation strategy that's, incred that's incredibly important. Third, we need to have jurisdictions continue to identify how to leverage weatherization models that can potentially inform how strategies are deployed. Many community members in our island Communities don't have the funding to bring their housing up to code, to fortify their housing, to put solar panels on their housing. It is incumbent on those with resources then to develop programs that can be a one-stop shop, a turnkey solution, so that community members that don't have resources can take advantage of all of the benefits of code and the safety measures that we are trying to promote. And then finally, we must always consider the importance of the nonprofit sector in the implementation of this work that Arturo's leadership and their leadership of so many nonprofits are critical to support at this time. And models like the Rapido Temp to Permanent Housing Model at Houston, Texas is a critical model that can be built and prototypes developed with, with community informed uh, information that can be able to support what we mean and define as resiliency. And there is an opportunity before us with all of the funding coming in through FEMA and the suite of HUD programs, um, as well as additional funding coming in through other agencies and localities to ensure that we have the funding to promote this work. And the promotion of this work looks at advancing community objectives, capital improvements, as well as how do you mitigate long-term costs with short-term and immediate investment. 
Um, and I want to take us through the Keep Safe book, which provides us with some examples of what we mean by defining resiliency and mitigation. Um, this book was created with uh, partners in Puerto Rico, including the University of Puerto Rico Planning and Architecture School, as well as the Building Association of Puerto Rico, and over 150 leaders throughout Puerto Rico, technical experts that informed how we define resiliency and how we define island-based housing mitigation. And I'm so proud we were able to feature Arturo's work in this as well, because it really is a textbook for, for the future, a textbook for the current day to help us define what resiliency means by and for communities, not just coming in from above. And so we are really pleased to say, and I want to take us through some strategies uh, for you today to be clear about what, what we mean by resiliency and, and mitigation for housing. How do we protect our housing? Um, so we know that Maria was just a one event in a series of events that has faced Puerto Rico, uh, and that as far back as we've been tracking, uh, that events have impacted communities at a very large level, uh, in times toppling communities. Um, we see that the communities uh, are denser and there's more exposure now to risk than ever before. And the danger is that as, as these events start to uh, become stronger and increase in strength and sequence, uh, we're going to face um, very extreme risk. It's also worth noting that there are multiple risks we must consider when thinking about designing housing for the future. We're not just looking at flood risk in Puerto Rico or the VI. We're looking at earthquake risk. We're looking at drought. We're looking at extreme heat. We're looking at extreme precipitation. So when designing housing, we must consider all of the multiple risks when we think about the houses adaptation and mitigation to the future. So in our Keep Safe book, we look at three sections or segments of risk. Um, this book is available in Spanish as well as in English. We look at atmospheric risks and we've identified risks and mitigation strategies to deal with high winds and drought, fire and extreme temperature. We look at land risks, erosion, landslide and earthquakes and subsidence. We also look at your, the water risks, the heavy storm events, the surges and the tsunamis that impact uh, our communities in the coastline. And the guide is comprised of several chapters and I'll just briefly walk these through. We look at the sequence of housing, this development and reconstruction. So housing has to start, mitigation and resiliency has to start from the identification of your risks that you'll find in the introduction chapter. Moving into your site itself, where are you building? What is the quality of your soil? How do you fortify your site so that your foundation and your building, your walls and your roofs, roof is safe? Then we move into building protection in chapter two, where we look at your foundation, how to fortify against earthquakes and flooding. Then we look at the walls, the anchorage, the roofing systems, and how do we make sure that that building can withstand a structural impact? Then we move into passive habitability, strategies that help us understand how to, habit, how to have habitable housing in the event of a power loss. So we're talking about the record, we, we're talking about lighting and ventilation and developing strategies for mold remediation. Then we move into energy strategies and these are your strategies on backup and efficiency and renewable. Then we move into water and our water strategies look at renewable, look at potable water as well as septic safety. Then we move into community strategies, emergency strategies, and then finally, how do you put it together? How do you fund the strategies, build a code, contract the right folks, pull your permits, get your insurance and design in accordance with multiple risk and resiliency? And all of these strategies are for a variety of stakeholders, from homeowners to construction professionals, from administrators to tenants, from community leaders to property operators. And we look at the slate of housing that's common in Puerto Rico, from the detached home built built, uh, self-built by a community uh, to a multifamily walk-up. We ask ourselves, what is a resilient home? And this is from a, a student that we've been working with, Antonio Rosado, who's been uh, who's the chief designer and, 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 and a developer of a lot of our drawings. We look at what are the elements of a resilient home in Puerto Rico? How can we move this forward? 
What does it mean to have agriculture growing on your site so you can provide food to your housing uh, occupants and your community? And what does it look like, again, to provide a, a strong foundation? How do you understand what goes into a strong foundation? How do you understand what goes into a solar component? We talk about solar power. We break down the components for you. What's an inverter? What is a solar system? What are panels? We also break down the various elements to how to build a potable rainwater system or waste disposal that's safe for your community. I'm so happy to have Arturo with us because we look at Arturo's work and what he's been doing with Paso Abuelo as an example of leadership and a model for so many communities around Puerto Rico because it is due to his vision and leadership that we have this is incredible strong community that we can cite that's important for Puerto Rico, but throughout the rest of the states. And we've been working to deploy this guidance in the VI with our partners at the university and the housing finance agency. Uh, this was actually the last place I went before we uh, were locked down. So I have a very strong connection to our friends and colleagues in the VI building this way. Um, and I'll conclude uh, with just pointing out, we also have a, a, a a complimentary guide on community resiliency centers, which is available to everyone in Spanish and English that my colleagues at Resiliency developed as part of our Keep Safe effort. And this is about how do we promote community resiliency for community hubs and not just looking at housing as a, a silo. We think about uh, Lucila Marvell's comment that we have to think about all communities and not just housing. And we're deploying this through the next year. We're gonna be having sessions on what does it mean to build resiliency into your housing with lots of different partners. Uh, and I'm just so happy to be with you all today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and uh, congratulations on making the Virgin Islands the last place you got to go um, before the <laughs> good planning. Um, you practically introduced Arturo for me. Um, I'm going to take a few moments, but basically by stressing that he's awesome, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, our second panelist is Arturo uh, Masaldia, who hails from the mountainous area of Puerto Rico in the municipality of Ajuntas, where his parents, Alexis Masol and Tinti Dia, founded the community-based organization Casa Pueblo. Arturo grew up in this project and has chaired its board of directors since 2007. Arturo is a public school graduate who went on to the University of Puerto Rico. He also uh, earned a doctoral degree from Michigan State University. Since then, he has been a faculty member and now a professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez campus. Uh, Arturo, um, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us today. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, take it away. Thank you for, for the invitation. Can you see my screen? Already? Okay, so, so this is Puerto Rico on September uh, 20, uh, 2017 when Hurricane Maria was passing, going through Puerto Rico. Uh, we are an island in the, in the Caribbean at risk of, uh, of climate change, uh, not only because of the storm, but uh, Lauri said it, it's about uh, droughts, it's about uh, heavy rain events, it's about uh, uh, sea level rise is about coral reef damage. It's about uh, crops uh, yields being uh, compromised, as well as productivity in the marine ecosystem. Um, so, if if you think about a storm of this size, I mean, it's not only the heavy winds. It, it's it's also about the heavy rain events. After the hurricane, over 100,000, 100,000 mudslides were registered by satellite analysis. So, so water was a big issue uh, and, and one of the most damaging uh, components to, to the Puerto Rican life. And this is a summary of what happened in Puerto Rico. This is the power uh, authority of Puerto Rico that, that generates uh, all of their energy in centralized units dependent on transmission and distribution lines to bring that energy into the houses and, and, and businesses and, and critical infrastructure like hospitals and others. And as you can see, uh, this, this is uh, Puerto Rico on September. 
2017. This is at Juntas, my community, the week after. This is at Juntas and the central area, a month after, two months, six months, uh, up to a year in many areas of Puerto Rico, a power outage. Um, still today, a few homes, a lot of homes are still energy left behind. Uh, power never uh, went back to, to, to their houses. Uh, and that's a reality that just that the government, they don't want to talk about it. And the consequences of energy failure was people relying on, on power generators, uh, making long lines to get access to fuel, handling the fuel, the fumes, the noise, uh, the risk of managing that, that fuel, uh, the cost of that uh, was a big deal. Uh, a lot of people die because of the power failure for, for, for a long time. People left, so we had a lot of climate refugees. Like 6% of the total population of Puerto Rico left the island because of Hurricane Maria. And we talk about the death of Maria, of Hurricane Maria, uh, and it's not the death of Hurricane Maria, it's the death associated to the government failure to provide basic services to, to the people. Uh, and, and not only that, think about the people who were pre-diabetic, pre-high blood pressure, eating uh, unhealthy food for one week, one month, several months. Uh, those people that were in this uh, borderline condition, now, uh, uh, for example, kidney failure had triple after the hurricane. And of course, the damages to the infrastructure is part of that, uh, of that reality. And, and still today, the government, they don't know how many homes are still, like almost three years after this hurricane, still living under blue tarps from FEMA. Uh, in, in January, we had a, an earthquake, a 6.5. And again, this is a summary of PREPA, another blackout. Uh, this time, not because of the failure of transmission and distribution lines, it was because the power generation, the utility uh, failed, uh, disconnected. Uh, if, you, if you have a natural gas power plant, then you have to go over and check that there's no damages to the infrastructure. If you find some, you have to fix it. So, so it take, takes a while for PREPA to respond. In, in this case, it was a week without power in Puerto Rico. Now we're facing the pandemic. And, and this, is, this is a short clip that uh, from the governor of Puerto Rico at the PREPA facility less than a week ago. As they're talking how well prepared they're and how ready they are, for uh, to face and confront the 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 hurricane season, and as they are talking, guess what? As they're explaining how well prepared they were, there was a blackout, a power outage, in their own facilities. Very shameful. This is how they tell Puerto Ricans how the government has prepared after confronting uh, Hurricane Maria a few years ago. Uh, but this is Casa Pueblo. This is in the central part of the island. Uh, we're a community-based organization. We're not FEMA. We're not the government. We're not about responding to emergencies. Uh, we're about social transformation, dealing with our conservation of natural resources. We have protected the land from unsustainable proposals like mining or, or a pipeline going through the forest. Uh, and we know, we recognize that Energy, the energy agenda is the greatest uh, risk, threat to natural resource conservation. So in 1999, we decided to uh, switch our home into running into uh, solar operation. We have upgraded through the years. And what, what we live with Hurricane Maria is that we had power before the hurricane and the day after we had power and people went there. Uh, and use Casa Pueblo as an energy oasis and to plug in the respiratory equipment or to recharge uh, personal uh, equipment. Uh, we have a radio station, we have a butterfly garden, we, we, have, uh, uh, we, we operate with 
uh, economic self-sustainability. We sell coffee and our brand is Coffee Café Madre Isla. And from those sellings, we, we operate. No, no money from, from, from the local government, not from federal funding. So this is all community driven. And what I wanna show you is our definition of resilience. For us, resilience equals community strength. It's not about making politicians stronger. Uh, it's not about building dependency models. It's about actually providing means for self-determination, means for self-sufficiency, uh, to make the community stronger. And as a community is more self-reliable, as a community, as a unit, uh, the community is, is stronger and better prepared for, for extreme conditions. But it's not only about extreme conditions stream conditions is about the day-to-day -day life is to improve quality of life for the daily operations so that's casa pueblo and what we have done after the hurricane is to we have launched what we call the the energy insurrection it's a bottom-up process to challenge the energy setup of the island which is fossil fuel dependent and because the government says one thing, but they refuse to actually do that transformation, we are promoting that. And we have our uh, communica communication tower is now running with solar power. We have uh, uh, energized uh, the barber shop. We have done the grocery stores in rural communities because those are the first line of access to food, critical infrastructure like the fire station, the emergency unit, the elderly home a restaurant, lechonera, for prepared meals. If something happens, that those guys can, can actually cook for the community. And, and this is how we have been transforming our reality. The elementary school, we have done homes that has a special medical needs. Uh, and, and after the earthquake, all of those places, they, 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 they kept running because they had power. Nothing happened. Uh, we were scared because of the earthquake. No physical damage to some of the structures, but, but power was there. And we were able to, to deal with the consequence in, in, a, better, in a better condition. Uh, at the bottom, you can, see, uh, you can see this guy. He's from the University of Michigan. We're working with hybrid systems. Uh, it uses biomass and the idea is can you use biomass to as an alternative input energy source for solar microgrids and and this is carbon negative this is another story that i'm not going to tell but but we're also working on innovation working with universities generating new knowledge uh, and as we are addressing the needs of the community and this is the the bottom line uh, now we have changed the energy landscape in Anjuntas, not only for homes, we have done it for critical infrastructure, for economic activation, we have done it to deal with poverty, uh, to, for food security, and, and so on. Uh, now we are dealing what we're promoting is 50 with sun, that 50% of the total energy demand in Puerto Rico can be, could be met with solar power by 2027. And, and, and and it is residential consumption, what we have been addressing first, which is a major energy demand uh, for the total um, pie for Puerto Rico. Uh, and this is what, what we're doing, helping homes to reach energy security and also the commercial sector. Uh, as we address and build uh, energy democracy and energy generation at the point of consumption with distributed solar systems, now we, we, we can help many homes. And, and we call it Cucubanos. We have done more than 50 uh, of them. So now Casa Pueblo is not the only energy oasis in the community. We're call, we, we, there's multiple energy oasis, energy secure sites that can provide, can make all the energy needs. can be done, it costs less than a vehicle. And our initiative, initiative is not public. Our initiative is not private. 
it's a social initiative. It's, it's a social engagement to help low-income families be also uh, energy secure. Uh, we are now building, we're do, working downtown and juntas, all the businesses, the place with the highest energy demand as a model for economic activation. The, the operational cost for those small businesses is extremely high. It's very difficult to, for them to compete with the Walmarts and the big companies that are coming from outside. Uh, and one way to, to, to help them is, is by them producing their own energy. It's a mean to, to, bring, uh, res, to build resilience. Uh, we're doing this with the Honol Foundation uh, and Rivian, an electric vehicle company. Um, welcome back, Arturo. Sorry about the technology hiccup. Please take a few moments to, to conclude and then we'll, we'll get into the Q&A. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. Uh, as you can see, it's not only the public uh, utilities are failing uh, Puerto Rico, also private utilities like communication is also failing us <laughs> in moments like this. Internet reliability is not that good in Puerto Rico either. Um, so uh, I, I was addressing that may maybe the bottom line is that for us, uh, resilience is community strength. And we have to find the ways to, to transform uh, our reality uh, and addressing energy energy self-sufficiency, energy independence for, for the island is a way uh, to make the island better prepared, in a better condition to confront uh, the economical crisis, to confront global warming and to confront other threats. Uh, it's, it's, it's a necessity, it's not an opportunity, it's a necessity for the island to move away from fossil fuels and we have to reduce our, e our ecological footprint. Uh, now we're energizing the Downtown Adjuntas, Adjuntas Pueblo Solar, and the idea is to reduce the operational cost of the main businesses, business, and uh, they're going to pay for the energy, and, and they're going to pay themselves for, for producing their own energy as we're setting up this infrastructure with the Hono Foundation. And that money that we're going to be generating because we're pro producing our own <laughs> power will be used to help low-income families reach also energy self-sufficiency. Um, so we can drive the transition from within. Uh, we have a solar cinema, in case you wonder, uh, mental health, to have, you know, the pieces of the community that you need uh, to embrace, not only on regular basis, but also in situations of, of difficulties. Uh, this is why uh, we have to build more self-sufficient uh, communities with their own leadership, with their own voices, and if you think about uh, the central part of the island being energy left behind, it was the last 30% that was repowered uh, after the hurricane. I think resilience has to go with investment. The investment has to go to those places now first, uh, help them reach energy security because those are the places that the government get last so in order to be more yeah. resilient, it's not the urban areas. You have to work with the remote areas and help those communities uh, be better prepared for the future. I, I want to just um, remark on something that Arturo just said. I, I consider that what I term reparative restoration, giving an investment in communities that have not received the investment that many other communities have received for a variety of reasons, um, and that that should be prioritized as a reparative effort. And also for, for justice. I mean, if you think yeah. about uh, those homes are running with solar power, they're saving like 40 to $50 a month. So if you think about poverty and that we have to address those social issues, as they're producing energy, they're also saving money that they can deal with, their, with other uh, you know, with, with, their, with their own reality. Uh, and that's not welfare. It will be, it will be they're producing energy as a mean to, to generate wealth from, for the family to be reinvested in the community. I mean, th those are the type of social transformation efforts that we want to, to push forward. Energy as a baseline to address other needs of the community. Thanks, Arturo. We're going to kick off the Q&A portion. 
And just as a reminder, if anyone has questions out there in the audience and some of the questions are starting to come in, um, go ahead and email them to us at ESI. Uh, the email address is ESI at ESI.org. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at ESI online and send them in that way. Um, thanks to those who've already done it. Uh, and uh, we'll do our best to get to those. But for now, Ellen, uh, take it away. Sure, thanks, Dan. And um, hi, Lori, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, lots of stuff there to unpack, lots of important issues that affect communities everywhere. And obviously in the islands, we do have these layered on challenges of uh, uh, continued recovery. And then the, like you say, the hurricane season to come. Um, you talked about uh, the need for resources to help people um, of all income levels upgrade their homes and design resilient structures. We know that these, um, if you do energy efficiency, you'll, you'll save money in the long run, but there's still those upfront costs. Um, we've been excited to, uh, about some of the new financing programs that are helping people make these upfront investments. Um, on their homes. And we'd love to see this for resilience measures as well. I was wondering, are you seeing more um, like government agencies interested in funding um, pre-disaster creation? Oh, you're on mute, Lori. Thank, uh, thank you, Ellen, for raising that really important question. So. We all know how hard it is and how expensive it is on many levels to recover housing and, um, and deal with, with uh, reconstruction after an event. Um, for example, uh, some of the funding coming into Puerto Rico, and Arturo, uh, great to have a conversation about this, uh, some of the funding coming in through HUD has taken years to deploy uh, the the good folks at Vivienda are, are standing up the reconstruction programs today, but it takes a while to deploy this funding. Um, it also takes a while to repair people's homes uh, for a variety of reasons, and it's very difficult to deal with the aftermath of the trauma that a community faces when there's an event, such as Maria or other similar events. I mean, the, the sheer trauma that occurs in a household when you're facing this kind of risk. And I think about the earthquakes most recently, how many children and youth are traumatized and that, that's very difficult to deal with. So we need to make sure that we have investments and in mitigation in advance of the event because um, it is much more cost effective and the return on your investment is, is considerate. So there are programs that exist, that have existed for a while that can support mitigation. I mean, the weatherization program of which, um, Puerto Rico gets a, a much smaller share, I think, than we, we should look at increasing the share to Puerto Rico for the weatherization program, because this is a program that is uh, effective at providing uh, homes with the support needed to mitigate weather risks. That's one uh, item I would put on the, on the agenda in terms of looking at increasing the investment to weatherization. Also, based on Arturo, Arturo's experience, you know, PREPA does not offer uh, significant support for incentives or renewable energy. For a variety of reasons, we don't have enough time on this call to get into, but there is a dramatic issue around the distribution of energy throughout Puerto Rico based on PREPA's grid. It's not working. Unless all of those lines get undergrounded, which is very expensive, it's never going to work. We need to invest in renewable energy and distributed energy so that communities in the mountains and communities in the coastline all have access to power that's equitable. And there needs to be support to the community organizations like Arturo's that are leading the effort that community organizations can't do it alone. We need resources, we need money, we need cash, liquidity to come in. Now, if uh, solar companies and manufacturers can contribute resources and supplies and technical assistance, that is a wonderful step forward. But there needs to be an attention to the role that community organizations play. Uh, and and that's one, one thing I would also 
promote. And the last thing I would say is we have an opportunity with the additional funding coming in through HUD, through the CDBG mitigation funding to think and vision and look at how to use that money to resolve some of the critical issues facing Puerto Rico and Guam and Hawaii and other communities that have gotten an allocation today. And so groups need to be um, brought to the table, community groups informing the process and really building a ground up approach because uh, that's almost $8 billion of funding coming in just for mitigation. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, Arturo, I'd love to just um, riff on that for a minute uh, because I really appreciated what you had to say about the social initiatives and, and all the, the, the issues that go with that, uh, the mental health and all that um, and bringing money back to the community. Have you all thought about, or are you doing also like training for young people who might be interested in learning more about energy efficiency or renewable energy technologies so that this is not only things they can do for their community, but it might be work that they could do that helps other communities? Not as much as we want. Uh, we have done it as a collateral thing. Uh, which is uh, not the right thing because there is a lot of need, uh, an opportunity for young kids to get training in technologies like this and be productive. And, and um, but but we are a small community organization. We're managing two state forests: Bosque del Pueblo, Bosque La Olimpia. We have a radio station. We have a butterfly garden. We receive like hundreds of people every single week. So, so the, all of those projects, solar projects, is sort of like a collateral effort of Casa Pueblo reaching out to the community, getting a lot of support from the diaspora, like the, like, like the people from uh, uh, diaspora Puerto Rican. There's one group in, in Washington who, who is very vocal uh, with Edil Sepulveda and his group, but also people in, in Philadelphia, Georgia, California, they have been helping us to help others. And, uh, and I think we have to do more. Uh, and training young people uh, is, is part of that, dealing with that reality that, that unemployment rate is so high in the island. Economic active, we need means for economic activation. And, and again, energy can be a driving force to address uh, that multiplicity, not of risk, of needs for the community uh, in, 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 the, in this island. Well said. And, you know, you said at the beginning that um, you're doing all these other things and it's something you would like to do more of. But, you know, frankly, through these activities in and of itself, I imagine these kids are learning. They're learning good examples from you, your parents and others. And uh, they're, well, you know how kids are. They, they love these technologies, so they're picking up on them. So that's, that's so exciting. Thank you. Um, Lori, uh, I wanted, I have other questions, but I probably should uh, hand it to Dan in case we had some come in from the audience. Thanks, we do actually have questions coming in from the audience. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, the first one. This is a question from someone who asked us a question online yesterday and we didn't quite get to his. So I'm gonna try to make sure um, that we get to it. His question is about um, replicability. Um, he congratulates both of you on your accomplishments and all of your work. Uh, and he says the model that you've been talking about, um, Arturo, your model and Lori, the, the models that would take place if someone were to follow your guidebook, um, it takes a lot of energy and resources. And I'm wondering what are the kinds of shifts in policies uh, in states, whether it's Puerto Rico uh, or other places, that would allow and support community resilience to have a wider impact more quickly and, and for these models to take root in, in new places to, to, to build on the work and, and that you've already done so far. Go ahead. Hey, Laura, we'll start please. with you. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll start with you, Arturo, since you're oh. <laughs> sort of on the ground and then we'll go to Lori for her thoughts. Um, we don't have a recipe uh, for what we're doing, but what we have been, what we have seen in Puerto Rico, like for example, in natural resource conservation, is other communities doing the same, protecting eco uh, highly ecologically important areas, and uh, 
So for the conservation point of view, that's, going, that, that's happening. The same thing is, is going on with the energy thing. It's not about Casa Pueblo. We're, we have been showcased here, but there's a lot of communities everywhere in Puerto Rico that truly understand uh, that we have to reach, build energy self-sufficiency. And they're doing their part. They're training. They're not, they, they're not called Casa Pueblo, but there's multiple of them. Mm. And what I will say is that resilience is not about investing, putting money and building something and, and, and you, you solve the problem. Right? No, no, you have to invest in our opinion to build community strength. As you build community strength, communities will be better prepared to deal with whatever happens. And, and the investment, if the investment helps to be the community in a better position, the community, not the politicians again, <laughs> not these people, uh, not FEMA goals, no, community goals. If you are strength, community goals from the bottom up, that's a good investment and, you, and it's going to pay off at some point. Uh, so, so if it makes the community more dependent, uh, and you're going to build the same thing of the model of dependency, uh, you're not helping the community uh, in the best way. So I, I will use that as a criteria to, to, to value uh, many of these investments and strategies to, to help communities reach, be in a better position for, to confront uh, global warming and, and, and other threats. Thanks. I, I want to build upon what Arturo said. We built the Keep Safe book to provide accessible information about what we believe is our strategies for building resiliency in homes. And we do have a, a big section on communities and also on energy. But what we wanted to do was to create a textbook that would help to generate information that could help encourage workforce development locally so that when the funding comes into Puerto Rico or the VI or other communities that, that local workforces opportunities are created so that communities have the resources to, and the, the know-how within the community to operate and maintain the systems to build, to design. Often we find in disasters, there's a whole um, set of workforce that gets introduced from outside of communities. We see, you know, especially in Puerto Rico, um, workforce that comes in from the states. And what happens is people earn money and decent money at that. And then people leave and go back to their homes in Mississippi and New Orleans and New York, leaving the community with not only not enough financial remuneration, but the um, capacity to deal with these ongoing events because the ongoing events are going to be happening in surges. And also many community members understand how to deal with that. So tapping local knowledge is really critical. Here's my, I don't have a recipe either, but I do have a vision. And the vision is, and I, I've, I've actually constructed facilities that are at environmental education centers. The vision is we can construct prototypes like Otoros and we use them to model what we mean to the government officials, to the funders, to the investors that want to place their money in the right way. But we need physical models. We need real brick and mortar to show people it works and to also measure that it works and to measure and create metrics so we can get more funding to support this work. Because without that, it's just a dream in a book. So it can be done. We have shown that it can be done. But you have shown that it can be done. Exactly. Don't. It can be done. It, it can be done. So can we, can we do this? in real time in other communities around the states and the world, build this and peers will come and show each other. And I, that's my dream that we will uh, do this in other places. Arturo, I look forward to meeting you in person. We will. <laughs> that's great. I love the idea that in lieu of recipe vision, um, the next time I open up a cookbook, I'm going to have a vision of something really delicious and hopefully if, they, if I work just get the that, ingredients out, right? you just need that's the right. ingredients we just need the ingredients that's right um we're gonna have one quick question to to conclude things and um I know we're getting close to the end but whenever someone submits a question on twitter I feel like they should should um to get a little bit of uh, extra airtime because that's a great way to communicate with us 
This is a question about um, your work and whether or not you have thoughts on um, natural solutions um, that can be employed to improve community resilience uh, and to mitigate climate risk. Um, have, in your work, whether it's in, in the guidebooks or in, um, in the work in the community, how do you incorporate natural based, nature based solutions or natural solutions into um, uh, you know, residential and, 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 and community resilience? And, oh, I should have said, <laughs> Arturo, we'll start with you. Um, actually, one of our projects is Bosque Escuela. It's a school in San oh, okay. Um So it's, it's for fun. education. And uh, the curriculum is actually the forest. So when the, the students go there, they see the plants and the canopy uh, yielding solar power for photosynthesis. They see the cooling effect below that canopy. Uh, and how the, the, the micro weather over there is better than just being exposed to, to the sun. And this is what we're telling them. Can we do the same thing in our homes? Can we play solar panels? Instead of photosynthesis, yield energy power for the residents, we do the heat that is heating the home. Then you can look at energy efficiency and say, can we reduce the power that is needed to cool down that space? And we have done that uh, heat, tra heat balance in the forest. We know that for one acre of land, you can re you reduce the uh, you produce equivalents of 12, 12 BTU, 12,000 BTUs units cooling effect. So the forest has that. And we can have that the same thing in, at home. And then you, you can address the issue of biodiversity and they see the value of biodiversity, even microbes that are decomposing and they see zero waste being produced in the forest. Can we do that at home and in our communities? If we can tolerate and value all the diversity, can we do the same thing with people? Uh, you know, black life matters and every life matters. Uh, as you are more aware of biodiversity, then, then, then you can extrapolate that into, into your own community. So we're, this, that, that is sort of like the approach that we're using uh, nature actually teaching us how to behave, how to improve ourselves, how to change our culture, and how to improve our infrastructure. Sounds like a cool project. Lori, do you, does your guidebook touch on um, nature-based solutions and natural solutions? Well, I want to, I want to quote a dear friend and mentor to me that Arturo may know, um, Dr. Fernanda Bruna, no. uh, who is one of my heroes in Puerto Rico. He's been leading so much um, work around green building and adaptation for 30 years before anyone even heard about LEED or any of the green building strategies. He was promoting this work and he said to me when we started the Keep Safe effort, he was with us from day one. He said he became an architect because he was standing in a park and witnessed um, how the trees were bending to the wind and how the adaption of the grass to the local soil condition was occurring. And he thought maybe um, he can build houses that can adapt to the natural world and that that's what we should be thinking about. And that's what has inspired the Keep Safe book, to build housing that can adapt to the changing conditions um, of our world, specifically with Puerto Rico. And so um, he's informed it, all of the folks that have worked on it inform it, and um, it's not just about mitigation, that resiliency is an emergent adaptive solution. So um, if Dr. Brunia is out there, lots of love to you, and thank you for the inspiration. Thanks, okay. Lori. Uh, and if he's and if he's not, just a reminder: he can visit eesi.org and watch a webcast uh, and read materials and presentations from today, but also the rest of the week. So hopefully, hopefully he's watching today. Um, well, we are just two. Oh, go ahead, sorry, Lori. One thing I want to leave the I have I did want to say, and I know we're concluding, but it's important when we consider building things, though. And this I'm speaking to the agencies and to um, electeds. We need to consider not only the upfront cost of building, but the cost to operate and maintain the systems. Because if we don't operate and maintain the systems and have money to do that, those systems will fail. 
And what that means is you will not be able to show success. So we always have to consider budget for operations and maintenance as well as upfront costs. Yep, I co-sign that sentiment 100%. Um, the emphasis on upfront costs is important, but it's only, it's only the beginning of the, only the beginning, not, not, not the whole story. Um, we are at the end. Um, I would like to thank you, Lori. Thank you, Arturo, for two really wonderful presentations. And um, uh, just can't thank you enough for making time in your busy schedules to join us today to talk about this really interesting and very important topic. Um, everyone uh, in the audience, thank you so much. Thanks to those who submitted questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. If you have a moment, um, please complete our survey. Uh, we'd love to know what you thought about today. Uh, uh, and um, if you have any suggestions for us to, to do a better job, we'd love to hear them. Um, I've said this a few times, but the materials from today, slides, uh, a web, uh, an archived webcast, and um, uh, also a written summary at some point in the next couple days will be available. You can visit EESI online at EESI.org. Uh, tomorrow uh, will be day three of our three-part mini-series. We will learn about sustainable democratic energy and public health. And once again, I uh, couldn't do this without uh, my colleagues, Ellen, Omri, Dan O, Anna, Amber, uh, our full cadre of interns, Sydney. Uh, thanks to everyone who contributed to uh, today's installment. And I look forward to seeing everyone back here tomorrow, 3 p.m. for Sustainable Democratic Energy and Public Health. Lori, Arturo, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.